So thank you very much, Lucas. Um, and um, thanks to the Riot, uh, to the user organizers for helping us with the space. Uh, it's really phenomenal. Um, and welcome, everybody. Um, so my name is Alex Bertram. I work at Be Data Driven. Uh, and I'm here to talk about one of our projects called uh, Rengine. Um, so it's, it's a pretty technical presentation, so don't hesitate to, to interrupt or ask questions. I'll try, we'll have to get through the 30 minutes, but um, I'm happy to, to interact during the presentation. So let me know if, uh, if something isn't clear or uh, you think it's not a good idea. Um, all right. So I'm gonna go through just a quick update about uh, Wrench as a project for, and I'm not sure if there might be people who are not familiar with it, but just to let everybody else know what we've been up to for the last year. Uh, and then I'm going to talk about um, Rich's different execution modes and how and some recent work we've been doing to, to kind of unify them. Uh, and I'll get into later what that, that means. So, uh, first of all, what is Rengine? Rengine is uh, an alternative interpreter for the R language uh, that's built on the Java virtual machine. So it's, uh, it's also open source. Um, it, uh, it reuses all of the R code from the base packages and the stats packages. Um, and, but we've rewritten the internals of the interpreter to use Java to take advantage of the JVM's state-of-the-art garbage collector and to use the code generation facilities of the, of the JVM so that we can, on Windows or Linux or whatever, we can uh, generate machine code uh, very quickly. Um, so some of the things we've been working on over the last year is uh, really pushing on, on a sub-project called GCC Bridge, which um, helps us run all of those wonderful packages with native code uh, on the JVM. So this is, this is something that takes C and Fortran code and C++ code, uh, runs them through GCC, performs some transformations, and spits out uh, JVM bytecode that we can then run in the, uh, the in Rengine, and it also allows us to, to do some transformations to handle, um, to make sure that they can, we can run multiple instances in, in the same process. Um, and to, to emulate the, the new R C API, so everything from the R internals, headers, uh, etc. So we've made a lot of progress on this, and now we now, I'm pleased to say, we now have uh, uh, much improved support for C++, including the latest version of RCPP. So a lot of packages that, that uh, require RCPP now are compatible for Engine. Um, we also have um, recently we have a. a a new bundle of Rengine. This is uh, the Rengine package. So you can uh, now install Rengine from within GNUR if you want to just use Rengine for part of your workflow, or maybe to speed it up or to try it out. Um, you can uh, just install, you can, I'm giving a talk on this tomorrow, so I won't go further, but it allows you to mix and match uh, Rengine from um, within, within GNUR and from within our studio uh, and your favorite you know, environment that you're, that you're already used to. Um, we've also put a lot of effort in the last year on our package repository and this, this whole continuous deployment. I mean, for anybody that's worked with our, our interpreters, I mean, the devil is really in the details. Like all of the edge cases, um, all of the, the behavior of the 700 built-in functions, that's all really critical to getting packages passed. So we put in a lot of work to, to run every version of Rengine gets tested across the packages in Bioconductor and Cram. We now have uh, integrated all the results from test stacks. You can see up here nicely on the left, this is from the R6 package. The only thing that's not working is the finalizers because the JVM doesn't guarantee that it calls finalizers. But uh, for each version, we also see, okay, you know, the last version we had extra five, five new tests passing. You know, 2397, we had 296 new tests passing. So we can really track and then also make sure that we don't have any regressions so that when we make an improvement that we're not breaking things that used to work with um, and one of the, the projects that's almost finished is this continuous benchmarking. So we, we, we have our benchmark library on GitHub, uh, but we're trying to really build this, this uh, uh, system using the change the R change points package to really detect when a build really, uh, either creates an improvement, an improved performance, uh, or uh, leads to a performance regression in one of our benchmark libraries so that we can really uh, make sure that we're making progress. And we've also seen, for example, that the different JVMs have a big impact on performance, so you know, whether it's 1.8 or 1.7, so those are the kinds of things that we're trying to tease out. Um, 
I'm also pleased to say we have a, we have a growing community. There are now many more open source projects that use Rengin. So like Orbis GIS uses it to embed uh, R to allow people to, to evaluate R in their mapping. Um, ImageJ is a, it's a platform for medical uh, image analysis. Uh, they now have a Rengin plugin. Um, and they use it for a lot of new plugins that they're building that builds on you know, using our packages in a JVM based system. Um, and we're very active on Stack Overflow and Google Groups, so um, you know, if you have any questions or bugs, you know, throw them up there. Um, so the last thing is, is that uh, we're also really excited to be working um, in the Sound Project, which is a um, biomedical uh, Horizon 2020 grant. So it includes, we're also uh, working together with Bioconductor, uh, EVML, and a number of other European academic institutions to, to apply range into their real world workflows and help improve um, their, you know, to make their run work run faster. Uh, and we've, we've, through that, we have funding through the end of next year. So we still have a lot of time left to, to make some big improvements on the project. Um, so that's that's the project in a, a kind of in a nutshell. Um, so now I'm going to, to shift into the kind of beat of the talk. Um, uh, but to do but before that, I'm going to, to kind of introduce um, how a engine is structured and it's it's different kind of execution modes. Um, so the idea is, is that you know not all R code is the same, um, and you're going to want different ways of executing and optimizing different types of R code. Um, so from left to right, we have you know, the basic one is the, the AST interpreter, which uh, is meant to handle all of the beauties of the R language, all of the complexities, whether that's substitute or parse or eval or defining new classes on the fly, all of that kind of flexibility. I mean, the AST, our AST interpreter looks almost exactly like New R's interpreter because that's the only way to get make sure it performs the same. Um, but that's that's not all. It's not you know not all R code is super flexible and you know uses a lot of dynamism. I mean one another type of workload that uh, we come across in, in benchmarks in our own work are uh, big vector operations, right? So this is actually something that, that R is, is, is also quite good at. Um, but for example, if you take the sum of a large vector, or if you take a large vector and subtract it from another large vector, or, or take a large set of data, data frame, or whatever kind of vector, and perform a small number of, of, of these vectorized operations on it. Um, so there you have lots of data and maybe two or three operations, maybe ten operations, but a small number of operations compared to, uh, to the overall data. Whereas you know, the other type of workload is um, more scalar operations. So if you have a for loop, you might have uh, a thousand R evaluations for every data point, right? So that's, that's a big difference. So the vector pipeliner, the goal of the vector pipeliner is to more efficiently execute um, these large uh, operations on large data. And specifically, one of the big things that we want to do is we want to automatically parallelize these operations. Um, so if you see here, these are just three lines of our code. Uh, the first line allocates a bunch of data, and then the second line transforms it in a small way, it takes a square root of, of one plus, uh, and then we subtract the two, the two means of those, of the x and y. Um, so if you look at on the right, you can see that as, as kind of a, as, a, as a graph of that computation. Um, and what you see is that, that actually those two means, they don't depend on each other. So you could, in, in principle, evaluate them in parallel. Um, and the question is, is how do we, you know, how do, how do, how do you do that, right, using the R language without having, forcing the, the programmer to actually do it themselves and to write it explicitly. Um, so by way of explanation, uh, I'm going to show you, I want to take a look at this one line of code. So if you, this is what the AST interpreter does, is it just looks at one evaluation at a time. And there it's very difficult to see what, how we can make that faster. You've got a bunch of data and you want to take the sum. Um, but if you step back a little bit and see where that code is in the program, you can actually see that this is one of um, 12 sums. Um, and you, 
you know, you would want to, to do all 12 of those sums in parallel. So I, I, what I'm trying to say here is, is that in order to really make these big optimizations, we have to wait until we see we have to wait until we see the whole program. Uh, we have to wait to see we can see more of the program and what the programmer is trying to do before we want, we want to start optimizing that. Because if all we see is this, we, we, there's not much we can do at that point in order to, to make it faster with the parallel. So we, we do that by deferring operations, right? It's, it's, it's by, by waiting until it's absolutely necessary to do um, the work. So when Regin evaluates this sum, uh, it doesn't actually do any work. It just kind of makes a bookmark. It leaves a bookmark and says, all right, this Z element now contains the sum of that thing over there. It's not done yet, but it's, it's, it's there. And that's, that's work that needs to be done. So, can you hear me? So it's just kind of leaving a bookmark and saying, hey, uh, I'm not going to do the work just yet. Uh, I'll come back to it. But uh, that's, that's something to remember. And but Regin just creates another object. It's like a fake vector, right? And so that fake vector still has a length. So you can still ask for its length. You can still ask for its class or its attributes. Um, you can do anything with it in, until you need to, to actually see what one of those elements is. And at that point, at that point, we trigger the, the evaluation. Um, and there you can do a lot of nice things. So you can do, for example, you can do automatic parallelization. If you look at this, this example here, if you wait, if you defer all these operations, right? If it's a square root, oh, we have first we have x plus one. We don't actually need to do that. I mean, nobody's asking to know what x, the, the tenth element of x is. So we just leave a bookmark. We take the square root again. We don't still don't need to do any work, um, and then it's not until we get down to here we still have a bookmark to the difference between two means. Until you print C or you want to actually examine that value, that we have to do the work, and then you can see all right the means are independent. We can schedule them on separate threads, and actually this mean here, this is one of the most powerful optimizations, is that you can see well rather than first doing adding these two vectors and then taking the square root and then looping over to find the mean, we can do that in one loop. Right? So we fuse that loop together into a single loop over the original data and applying these operations on each element. Um, so these are, these are super simple examples. Uh, but uh, I really want to underscore that this works in, in, for, for very complex R code. Uh, and it works in packages. You don't have to rewrite packages to use this. You don't have to change the code at all. Uh, you can take this monster of a, of a benchmark here from the survey package, uh, and this is calling it to hundreds of different functions. And in each of those functions, there's, uh, yeah, there's, there's operations on these vectors, but they're being deferred because nobody's actually looking at the values. So it's possible. So I mean, this, this is the real meat of it is that you loop over the, the columns of the weights and you replicate the means using different weights. Uh, but of course, you don't actually look at those, those means until later on in the program. So all of this gets deferred to the, the amazing, uh, this amazing monster here, where you can see that actually all 12 of those sums and call sums are independent. They can all be scheduled on separate threads. Uh, this tree already has a lot of things removed. I mean, one of the optimizations is that a lot of times, you know, weight is one. So, you know, then rather than doing that, we that it gets skipped. Um, and all of these sums can be fused so that, they're, that they, they can be done in one loop over the data instead of A. So all of this adds up to um, pretty significant savings. So again, this is, this is from the forthcoming article in uh, the Journal of Statistical Software. Um, on this benchmark here, as the data increases, um, I mean, right without it, without these optimizations, with these optimizations turned off, I mean, it just it just starts to explode because you're using more and more memory, and that that creates churn and pressure on the garbage collector. Um, I mean, new R here, uh, it's it's it continues at, at you know you hit a certain point, and the memory pressure also becomes a significant feature, um, and. 
yeah, on one thread, Wrench is able to significantly out uh, perform it, uh, the baseline. And as you add more threads, you know, it, it can actually the time stays constant because the work can be scheduled out to, to different threads because all of those, those nodes are independent. Everybody's very quiet. Does it make no sense or is it completely clear? So this is this is French Effective Pipeliner. Uh, I mean, we owe a lot of this work to collaboration with CWI with uh, Hannes Mühlheisen in the audience uh, to really kind of apply the same optimizations that you use for a database, that you apply this to, to statistical analysis. Um, but of course, this this these optimizations principally work for our built-in operators like call sums, sum the plus and the minus, all of these kind of primitives uh, that we can say, oh, well, you know, we can create a bookmark for the sum, uh, you know, for cross product, and for square root. These are all built-ins and, and, you know, we can kind of play with them a lot, uh, a lot easier. But what about our code? Because, of course, um, you know, R is all about writing your own functions and your own operations on this data. So, um, one of the questions that we've had for a long time is, is how do we apply those really powerful global optimizations to kind of the scalar R code? Of course, this is, this is the, the kind of code that everybody is told not to write in R, right? So you have, uh, you have a for loop that's using, uh, that's, that's doing scalar operations, right? So as you're, you know, for, for this loop, each iteration, you're evaluating probably altogether maybe 10 or 15 um, our expressions. Um, so that means, you know, back here we had maybe, you know, for, for our first simple example, you have maybe 10 million data items and three R expressions, right? Sum, square root, addition. But here, for each data item, you have 15. Um, and that's where really R starts to suffer because R is, you know, for the R language, you've got to do a lot of heavy lifting here. You know, that plus is not just a plus because you've got to check to see whether that S has a class. Because if the S has a class, then you've got to look up to see if there is a plus dot foo or a plus dot uh, whatever it is. You know, if it's an S4 object, you've got to do even more. Um, you know, the, the plus could be overridden, it could be changed to something else. Uh, the square root could also is also generic, right? And then you have not just the square root, but then the math root that you've got to check. And each time you do this iteration, you've got to go up and see if something's been changed. Right? So this is this is why, I mean, this this kind of code gets try to shuffle off into a different part of the interpreter that's much better at, at dealing with this kind of thing. Um, and that one we call the JIT loop interpreter. And, and the basic idea is, is that, yeah, there's a lot of power that R gives you, but in a lot of the cases, uh, you're not using all that power. Sometimes you really just want to array, add an array or sum an array of double precision numbers. You don't want to use classes, or maybe you don't want to use 15 classes, maybe you want to use one. Uh, and so the, the compiler is an attempt to, you know, we get into this for loop, we see that there's going to be 10 million iterations, and you think, well, maybe this is a good time to stop uh, and look at the body of the loop and see if we can uh, predict what's going to happen so that we don't have to, every time we go through a loop, see, okay, what is the class of S? Is there an S uh, plus dot foo? Is there, you know, let's look up the plus symbol in the environment and do all of these things. Um, so the idea is, is like, well, let's approach this. Let's try and get this in a format that um, C or Fortran compilers would be happy. Um, so, for example, here we can we can the first thing we do is we resolve all the functions. So we go and we look for the function definitions, and then we make sure that there are no changes to those function definitions in the body. And if that's the case, then we can put this into a nice, simple three-address code structure. Uh, it would just look like something you're compiling C. We put it into control flow graph, which is again textbook compiler stuff. Um, and then we do, and then we we propagate. We, we use this sparse conditional constant propagation to infer types uh, for all of these variables, right? Because that's that's really what we want to know. We want to know is this is this S here? Is that a vector with 10,000 elements, or is that maybe just one element? Because if it's one element, 
we can stick it into a processor register. And then we can, we can do the addition in one instruction. Whereas if, if it's 10,000 elements, well, we've got to set up the loop, we've got to, uh, you know, we've got to do all this bookkeeping, you're probably losing tens or hundreds of cycles for each addition. So we basically just kind of push values down through, through this tree. So we know that we know at the beginning of the loop what the values are, that they have uh, the Z, for example, this is, is, uh, is a sequence of elements from one to, to one million. We know that S1 starts out as being an integer, um, and then you just keep pushing that down. So S2 gets here and you know, well, this, I know what happens when you, in R, when you add an integer plus a double, you get a double. You always get a double if it has no classes. So you can use all that information that you know at runtime to figure out, to infer, you know, what are the types, what are the attributes of all of those values in your loop. Um, so by the time, by the time that we get to the compilation stage, you know, we know everything about this piece of code, this loop file. Um, and if we don't, right, if there's something really dynamic, like in the middle of the loop body, somebody calls you know source temp slash te you know text dot uh, then then we say okay now you're on your own we'll run it through the interpreter. Um, but um, it, uh, if we get to if, if it is really simple code, um, the, the, the 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 results are really astounding. Um, so for example, this this simple sum loop using the square root here. Uh, you know, with the newer, with the, the AST interpreter, uh, it's 25 seconds to run for, for uh, is that 10, 100 million items. Uh, with the bytecode generator, with the bytecode compiler, it's 12. Um, but if you, if you compile this statically, if you do the type in, for instance, it's one second. And I mean, this, the, the more function calls you add, um, you know, you can make these numbers as big as you want, right? So if I add a class to X, Right, because that's that now forces the AST interpreter to go and look for all of these methods. Yeah, then it blows up to 60 seconds for, for 100 million. But of course, French can see at the beginning of the loop that there is no uh, plus dot foo defined. And because we know that there's no plus dot foo, and we know that in the loop body there is going to be a plus dot foo assigned, we can skip all of that. Yeah. And if you do functions, um, a function call is, is just murder in R to do in a, to do it properly, right? To do the argument matching, you've got to look for uh, match the names correctly. If it has names, to find where it's defined, uh, to create a new environment. To, I mean, there's so much work that goes into a function call. Um, but what we do is we just inline it, right? So we say, okay, half square is uh, is defined there. We know that it doesn't change. We can prove that it doesn't change. So we're just going to inline that and avoid the function call altogether. So the, the time stays is time stays relatively constant with wrench and the JIT, um, but you know it just blows up to to, to 300 seconds. Uh, if you add a couple more function calls, you can keep that number uh, line. Okay, right, so that's that's kind of a long introduction to to the topic that the new topic that I wanted to present today, which is how do we get these two components to talk to each other, right? So the the JIT compiler. Um, is really good at um, you know executing this for loop here, um, but that's probably not going to be the only for loop in, in a real program. You might have a series of for loops, you might have different for loops, and what we want to be able to do uh, is to apply the same kind of global optimizations to to hand like what you call handwritten R code that the the built-in operators benefit from. So. Um, I should be able to write a sum function in R and have it perform just as well as the built-in sum function. That's that's basically the goal. So the nice thing is, is that we can use all of this type information that we found uh, to answer a really important question, which is: um, Does the code have any side effects? Right? Does does the code? Do I/O in the loop, for example? Is it writing to a file? Is it writing to, um, you know, the? Do, is, it, is it doing anything that, that's observable? Um, and we can do that because during the JIT compilation, you know, we've, we've we've resolved all the functions and we know all for all of the built-ins 
which of them have side effects. You know, if you if you try and do uh, an assignment to the global environment, or you try and read or write from I/O, or you do any of those things, um, we'll know that this function is not pure; that it has side effects. So we can't paralyze it without changing the meaning of the program. Uh, and so, what we can do is we can basically, and it's the same thing for S apply. So, if you have S apply or L apply, we can also take that function and apply the same kind of analysis and compilation to determine, yes, okay. That super simple function that has this is the, the intermediate representation, uh, it has no side effects, and so it could be parallelized. Uh, and it could be deferred now. So that just like we did for the built in operators, just like we did for the built in operators, um, we, can, we can defer it, right? We don't have to do the work because we've done the analysis. You know, if x is greater than maybe 100, maybe it's 200, or maybe it's, if it's greater than 1,000. If we've done that analysis, then we can see we don't have to do the work now. We can, we can return a placeholder. We know how long it's going to be, right? Because we know how well the length of x is. Um, and, and so we can just leave it a placeholder, and then you end up with these, these, these trees with applies in them, and, and then you can schedule them on separate threads if they're independent. Uh, we're working on the same thing with for loops. So just with like a for loop. We know, okay, first of all, does it have side effects? And we know which variables are updated in the loop. Um, so if, if we can determine their length, or if we can determine enough properties about them, because we need to know, to, to defer these objects, we also need their, to, to know their attributes. Then for each of the variables that's updated in the for loop, so we defer the for loop, we say we're not doing the for loop right now, we're gonna wait until uh, you know, we have a better overview of the work to be done. And we're going to return, we're going to update the environment with a placeholder for the updated value of s. And as soon as somebody needs s, they want to print it, that's when we trigger the deferred evaluation. So you end up with a node in your tree that maybe has several outputs, all of which could trigger this running this for loop. Um, and the great thing is, is that we can also apply the same kind of logic to, uh, to native code. So code that was written in Fortran. Um, and are using the dot call interface. So what we've done is we've provided kind of like these wrappers for all of the functions in our internals and, you know, I don't know, we just, I ran through a script and it, and it gave me some, some placeholders, like you have RFFL. These are Java methods, right, that, that, that actually, the, the code gets transformed, your native code in a package, the Fortran code, the C++ code, it gets translated to all these Java methods. And these are annotated, right, so we started to annotate them so that we know, okay, which ones have side effects. So if you have a code, that, if you have a, if you're calling a dot Fortran function that calls, you know, or maybe it calls another function that calls, you know, eval, then we know, oh, that's got side effects, or it could have side effects. We, we can't, you know, we have to just run this now. We can't defer it. Uh, other functions, if it's just duplicating, for example, uh, an S expression, then those are not annotated with impure, and so we know, yeah, all right, that's fine. Um, we could probably we can defer this until until later. So if you look at how that kind of a real world example, this is uh, this is from one of our biological benchmarks. It doesn't maybe give you a lot of context, but they're basically running this k means through you know two to two to twenty five uh, different cluster centers and saying okay which one is the best? You know if you, between using two clusters or fifteen clusters or twenty five clusters, which of these uh, is going to pr produce the, the the minimum of uh, within yeah within groups squared it sounds but uh, we can use that kind of analysis to determine that k means that which is actually a dot Fortran call uh, doesn't have any side effects uh, and so it can be deferred um, and then you end up with again these nice graphs that we love. Um, basically where these are actually you know these are all Fortran um, or C calls to C code, uh, but Wrench can automatically parallelize that because we're able to do the analysis to determine there's no I/O, there's no um, extra stuff. So um, this will be the next version of Wrench, um, and uh, come to my talk tomorrow if you're interested in, in using the Wrench package, which you can use uh, within GNU R to to use for select workflows. So thank you, thank you very much.